there is a recurring refrain, an old walking song, in the great Middle Earth legendarium of J.R.R. Tolkien. It appears both in The Hobbit and in The Lord of the Rings at strategic moments. The song is first recited by Bilbo Baggins at the conclusion of his journey back to his beloved Shire, following his grand adventure, coming through a copse of trees to the top of a rise, he at long last lays eyes on his home at the horizon. He stops and he sings. The roads go ever on and on. The under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone turn at last to home afar. The eyes that fire and sword have seen and horror in the halls of stone. But look at last on meadows green and trees and hills they long have known. Later, both Bilbo and Frodo sing another stanza as they individually depart from the Shire, this time for an even grander adventure. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where... Uh, many paths and errands meet, and, and whither then? I cannot say. At last, Bilbo sings a final stanza in Rivendell. At the end of all their adventures, the road goes ever on and on, now out from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, let others follow it who can. Let them a journey new begin, but I at last with weary feet will turn towards the lighted end, my evening rest, and sleep to meet. In 1965, the British composer Donald Swan collaborated with Tolkien in composing new tunes for that old song. They, they, they wrote in the introduction of the printed version of the score that in some ways the great life lessons of the whole Middle Earth saga could be summed up in this one simple song. The road goes ever on and on. Just knowing that should humble us. Uh, knowing that, that should embolden us. Knowing it uh, should guard us against presumption, against complacency, against hubris. Uh, knowing this it should set our feet on the next great adventure every time we step our foot outside our front door. The road goes ever on and on. Knowing this uh, may well be one of the most essential lessons of good and godly education. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once wrote in his wonderful John Plowman's talks, I, I would have everybody able to read and write and cipher. Indeed, now I don't think a man can know too much. But mark you, the knowing of these things is not education. And there are millions of your reading and writing folk who are as ignorant as neighbor Norton's calf. <laughs> now those ignorant masses of whom Spurgeon wrote are not those who failed to finish their lesson. They are instead those who did finish. Or, or rather, uh, those who naively thought that lessons were the sorts of things that could be finished. See, the truth is, education does not have a terminus, a polar extreme, a finish line, an outcome. Instead, it is a deposit, an endowment, a promise. 
even a small taste of the future, the road goes ever on and on. For many, it is sad to say, this uniquely Christian perspective is an entirely foreign worldview, an alien notion, an arcane paradox, an unfathomable mystery. Minds dulled by the smothering conformity of popular culture cannot plumb the depths or explore the breadths of a distinctively Christian virtue of hopeful contentment in the face of perpetual tasks. That they thus uh, put, rush forward uh, into what they think will be the termination of this or that or another chapter of their lives. They cannot wait to finish school. But thus for them, graduation is not a commencement, but a conclusion. Afterward, uh, they hurry through their lives and their careers. They uh, plod impatiently through their work week, anxious for the weekend. They bide their time until vacation and uh, then plod on toward retirement, always coming to the end of things until at last things come to an end. But within the Christian worldview framework, hopeful contentment in the face of never-ending responsibilities is a virtue that uh, continually breeds in us an anticipation for new beginnings and not just old resolutions. It's a virtue that provokes us to a fresh confidence in the present as well as in the days yet to come. That, that is simply because it is a virtue rooted in understanding uh, God's good providence applied to the whole of life and the covenantal fortunes of his grace. We, above all people, we who were brought from death to life, uh, we who were brought from the end of ourselves to the threshold of eternity and the beginning of all glorious beginnings, we of all people understand this. In fact, but this is the very essence of the gospel. The crucifixion, it's not the termination of Christ's mediatorial work. Rather, it is the conjunction of two beginnings, the incarnation and the resurrection. It's the pivot of civilization, demarcating a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As a result, we Christians are innately an optimistic people, forever starting anew, affirming our faith in full accord uh, with the patriarchs and the patristics. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And thus, the all talk of education is a reminder for us that we've only just begun to learn how to learn. It's an affirmation that although our magnificent heritage has introduced us to the splendid wonders of uh, literature and art and music and history and science and mathematics and ideas in the past, we've only just been introduced. And that a lifetime adventure in these vast and portentous arenas still awaits us. Indeed, the most valuable lessons that education can convey are invariably the lessons that never end. This is actually at the heart of the Christian philosophy of the home, of the family, of education. The road goes ever on and on. Educational excellence from a biblical perspective thus is not so much concerned with the amount of data accumulated in a student's head, uh, but a way of thinking and acting woven into a student's life. This is the great legacy of Christendom. We don't want you just to do the right things. We want you to love the right things. We don't want you just to uh, obey the rules. We want you to be reformers who are pushing forward to the full limits of, uh, of what is right and good and true and write the new rules for the future. 
But we are the beneficiaries of an extraordinary web of relationships. And that's a part of the reason why our, our view of education is so holistic, so woven together with the people that we know, the folks that have mentored us, the folks that we're accountable to, and the folks that we're accountable for. Uh, we've begun to understand that true education is more about a culture than it is about a curriculum. It's more about a way of life than it is about a way of doing. It's a vision of what God has called us to rather than a mechanical set of prescriptives that are implemented in our lives. It's about relationships, about community, about the rich covenant into which you have been engrafted by God's good providence. And you, of all people, have tasted and seen the beauty, goodness, and truth of this, woven into every single subject that you have studied. Arthur Quiller Cooch, the mentor of a host of literary luminaries, including C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, and Dorothy Sayers, once described what we have received in this fashion. You are the heirs of a remarkable legacy, a legacy that has passed into your hands after no little tumult and travail, a legacy that is the happy result of sacrificial human relations no less than of stupendous human achievements. A legacy that demands of you a lifetime of vigilance and diligence so that you may in turn pass the fruits of Christian civilization on to succeeding generations. This is, he said, uh, the biblical view, the covenantal view, the classical view of education. This is the great legacy of truth, which you are now the chief beneficiaries. As Frodo braced himself and his hobbit companions for all the uncertainties of the road that lay ahead of him, he recalled Bilbo's earlier musings about the road. Piathan used to say, for a quit, that there was only one road, that it was like a great river. The springs were at every doorstep and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door, he used to say. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you may be swept off to. So it is for you graduates. The road goes ever on and on. Knowing this should humble us. Knowing this should embolden us. Knowing this should guard us against presumption, against complacency, against hubris. And knowing this should set our feet on the next great adventure every time we step foot out our door and onto the road. The road goes ever on and on. Knowing this may well be one of the most essential lessons you will ever learn. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these graduates, for their families, for the investment that has been poured into them, not just in the last few years, but over the course of the whole of time as the gospel has been woven into art and music and literature and ideas and, and now woven into their hearts and minds and lives. Bless them. Use them. Glorify yourself, O oh God, uh, through all that they are and all that we, they do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduating class of 2017.